Democracy That Delivers is brought to you by the Center for International Private Enterprise. Now to your host, Ken Jakes. Hi, everybody. This is Ken Jakes. I'm the host of Democracy That Delivers, our podcast at Site, And I'm joined by Adam Sachs. He's an associate program officer with a global team at Site. Adam, uh, nice to have you on the program. And you're new to me. We, we've never met. And, and it's just another uh, aspect of COVID because we haven't been in the office in a year and a half. But, but welcome to Sype and welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Ken. Proud to be here. So why don't you introduce yourself to our audience and tell them a little bit about yourself and, and how you ended up at Sype. And uh, quite frankly, I'd be kind of interested myself So since we've really never met. Yes, uh, definitely. And uh, so I've been here at Sype for about a year and a half. COVID definitely did impact a lot of our in-person interactions. I uh, came from Capitol Hill, uh, some, a legislative background, but then ended up focusing more during my graduate studies on uh, the intersection between democracy and technology. Where'd you go to graduate school? Uh, George Washington University, the Elliott School of International Okay, Affairs. terrific. Yeah, so... Um, I definitely I had a great experience there and segued me and enabled me to uh, engage in uh, democracy promotion, especially around uh, local improving and, and helping uh, local business communities. And so it, it's been a wonderful time here. Oh, great. Yeah, I'm glad you're at SIPE. You know, as I said, it's been a weird year and a half. We literally have not been in the office other than just to move stuff around, but we've never met as teams or anything like that. My team, the communications teams, works really close with uh, the global team. But I'm glad you're here, and I know SIPE is as well. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is advancing data privacy and protection in Kenya in particular. And we're joined by Sheila Bergen. She is the CEO of CORD, and she's also with the 2021 Open Internet for Democracy Leader. What is CORD, Sheila? And welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. So our focus at CORD is actually on a providing an enabling environment for, for startups and SMEs. And what does CORD stand for? A cable. No, it's not an acronym. It's like a cable. Okay. So the we show connect. connection. Exactly. Gotcha. So we yeah. connect We connect them to different opportunities. But uh, more importantly, uh, our focus has been on policy because um, I've been in the entrepreneurship and innovation space for a while. And okay. one of the challenges that I noticed a lot of businesses were facing was just that whole understanding regulatory frameworks, understanding policy and how that can affect their businesses. And then we got into how internet is, you know, has accelerated um, either use of, of different products within technology, but also has provided a lot of division and lack of access for a lot of people in, in the continent. And so policy is really one of those pillars that could change this a lot, especially if government is deliberate around that. And so that is why I got into into uh, focusing on, on, on policy work at CORD. Well, Adam, before we really get into, you know, what the Open Internet for Democracy initiative is all about, I want to ask Sheila to tell us a little bit on why data privacy and protection is so important in Kenya. Yeah. So, so we have this, um, I don't know if it's just a cultural thing where we go to buildings and people write all their personal information on a notebook that is just mm -hmm. you can read everybody's information so their phone number their id number their full names they can ask you anything so literally any information about me you can find it on a book in some random building and so <laughs> the danger of this is towards political uh, years when we have elections um sometimes people collect that data and then they sell it to to people who send marketing political messages to to uninformed citizens. And that is really dangerous. So this year, um, there was a time all of us got notification that we had been registered to political parties in Kenya. And so we went online and checked, and apparently we had been bona fide members of political parties. So that is the, the reason why, you know, data protection is quite important, not even just for business, just for, for social good but also for making sure that citizens are informed about their, their privacy and their data is not taken for granted or used for malicious reasons. Like, for instance, in this case, where I'm registered in a political party that I've never heard of, but apparently my document is there and I have to follow legal procedure for me to remove my name from a political party that I did not sign up. So that is why it's, it's quite, quite important. 
and, and what about the digital divide in Kenya? I, I know that's probably a problem because it is in mo- most countries that are developing economically. Can you tell us a little bit about that, the haves and have nots in this space and, uh, and how digital protection really affects that? So the, the funny thing about Kenya is all of us have mobile money, which means we can pay for services anywhere we go. We can buy and, and, and sell anything, could be on the internet or whatever physically, but I can pay using my phone. And so the, while that is good on, on one side, accessibility and affordability of internet is still quite low. And a lot of people cannot afford to, to even, you know, buy basic bundles. And so when, especially when COVID hit last year and, you know, there was introduction for a lot of services to go online, uh, be it education, be it health, a lot of people are left behind. And, you know, we get a lot of numbers here and there saying, you know, the, the internet penetration is quite high. But then something like this happens and you realize, especially in public schools, kids could not access education at all. That is right. that is like how divided the has and have not in, in this sense. Health, the same thing. You have to, and, and for our case, we have to file our taxes online. And so it means if I don't have internet, I cannot even comply to government regulations for me as a business, for me as an individual. And, you know, that I think is um, is a big challenge for, for Kenya, but over and above Kenya, I think for most developing countries, because they really don't look at people who cannot access internet because they say, okay, you can go to a center and they will do this registration for you. What that means is I'm also giving all my data to somebody at the center. Right. So again, which is what we're talking about today, which is, yeah. which is privacy and security. And, and even, even if you have your own device, I'm sure there's problems with security as well yes. uh, that, that we're going to get in and talk about as well. And Adam, I think that's a good segue into asking you, what is the Open Internet for Democracy initiative? What is that all about? Sure, Ken. Uh, well, as the mass movement towards the digital space has demonstrated, particularly with the COVID-19 pandemic, the internet has profoundly reshaped how citizens communicate and businesses operate. Unfortunately, authoritarian governments are de- and declining democracies are taking steps to curb digital rights. As a result, Freedom House notes, that global internet freedom declined for the 10th consecutive year in 2020, as a growing number of governments are using the internet as a tool for surveillance, political distortion, and societal control. In order to enhance the capacity of digital reformers to respond to closing digital spaces, CIPE, the National Democratic Institute, created the Open Internet for Democracy Initiative. Uh, This is a grassroots-driven initiative uh, that connects private sector actors and representatives from civil society, and independent media from across nascent and declining democracies to challenge restrictions on internet freedom, preserve a, an open and secure digital space, and defend digital rights. With the uh, input uh, from our local partners and uh, you know uh, open internet leaders like Sheila, SIP, NDI, and SEMA developed digital rights literacy and advocacy resources such as the Democratic Principles for an Open Internet and the Open Internet for Democracy Advocacy Playbooks. These resources serve as practical tools for advancing digital freedoms, focusing on tailored approaches to advocacy that apply across diverse local contexts. So how, how does this initiative really impact or help countries like uh, Kenya, where, where, where Sheila is working? Certainly. Well, this initiative takes a holistic approach and really looks at the, the media sphere, the civil society sphere, and then, of course, at site's angle is the, the private sector sphere. And it looks to uh, equip our emerging uh, democratic reformers to understand a little bit more about the impact of the digital rights space and the importance of internet freedom and equip them with the advocacy skills to really make change locally, but to uh, protect the digital rights uh, within their local context. We have what is the the Open Internet for Democracy Leaders Program, which Sheila is a leader. And, uh, you know, this is a non-resident leadership program that empowers emerging leaders from across the globe to build their advocacy and organizing skills to protect internet freedom. Uh, In its three years of programming, the initiative has supported 20 emerging digital rights reformers to implement research or advocacy projects focused on digital rights in countries such as Cameroon, Nigeria, Peru, Ukraine, Lesotho, and Pakistan. So all over the world. All over the world, all over the every region, uh, we, we, we look to, to work. Adam, you know, I, I've worked in Eastern Europe for a long time be- uh, before I came to site, and as well as South America. And while cultures are different everywhere, 
the same types of problems are are universal. So tell us a little bit about, and, and Sheila, jump in here too as well. What are some of the things that you see in Kenya that you see universally when it when it comes to, to data privacy and protection? Okay, so I think violation, especially now online, um, and this specifically for women, there's a lot of bullying that is happening. There's also a lot of, I think, uh, political influence online that is... Uh, bot if i can put that in in quotes so you can you can create bots that can make you trend all the time and this influences a lot of people on how they make decisions same thing for businesses people are buying people's data online so i think most of this happen across the the especially countries that are not very particular about uh, security and, and data protection of uh, data subjects. So uh, it happens in Kenya. The good thing with us is we have a bit of freedom. We can call out government online and we use especially Twitter and Facebook a lot for advocacy and, and government listen. So that has worked in our favor. Our uh, contrary, if that is taken away from the citizens, then you've gagged people completely. So they know the power of what we have. At the same time, they know it's really easy to manipulate that because they don't have an advocacy tool anymore. We are not really, um, people go to the streets, but not really as much as before. So they use digital uh, platforms to be able to do advocacy. So I think that is something that our government has not really gone into it, but I think they know the power of digital platforms and what it could do. And we've seen this happen in, in a number of African countries where they shut down internet, especially, yeah. Let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the Data Privacy and Protection Act in Kenya. What were some of the things that, that led to the act and what made government finally decide to, to do something? Okay. So I think the for most governments, at least, they look at, at uh, what other governments are doing because ours is really quite informed by the European Union uh, one, and it borrows almost 90% of what that... Um, uh, the, the laws they have, so it could be one of the reasons. But two, I think because um, a lot of uh, international companies are playing a huge role in Kenya. Kenya is one of, I think, the key markets in, in Africa for a number of international uh, corporations in, in technology. And so I think the, you know, trying to protect the data subjects who are locals, even though it's not really clear in the in the Data Protection Act, whether they must store their data locally, and that's one of the challenges. Um, it is one of the reasons they thought, okay, it would be good to protect data subjects from these international corporations within technology that are operating in the space. There was also really a lot of push locally from ecosystem players around ensuring that uh, the data of, um, I think, after elections in 20. Our previous election, you know, right. there was, yes, there are documentaries around what happened in Kenya and how data was used to manipulate people, true or false. We, that is, you know, up to people's interpretation and, and you know, looking at, at uh, information that's out there. But that is also another reason why this act was really pushed for it to, to come to, to be a, a law. How did COVID have an impact on on this? Did, is how COVID has really accelerated the use of digital technology. And of course, when you accelerate and you make change quickly, you try to get more people involved, you have security risks, you have, you have privacy risk, more risk. And so the need for protection is even more so. What has your country, what has your government done to really address that during the COVID period? Uh, so first of all, the, the act was passed in, in last year, no, 2019. Right before COVID. Yeah. Just before, it, in November actually. So the, the, it was already, yes, it was already um, in, the, in the works, but it was passed uh, in 2019. And and then ensuring that the data commissioner's office was set up, I think because of COVID, they had to really accelerate that. So the data, right. yes, the data commissioner's office was already been set up. They already have, she's already in, in office and they are drafting, they've been doing, um, they've been engaging us, players, especially in the private sector around how they can implement this and the challenges we see and, you know, proposals around what amendments can be done. So that, I think, also accelerated that bit. And I think because everything has to be done virtually, they also have to test some bits 
of, of what this uh, this law looks like. And I believe there might be a bit of changes on this because of that. Uh, on the contrary, also, the, the budget that has been allocated for this particular office is quite low. So it makes you wonder, okay, are we really keen about implementing this or not? It's the, probably the lowest budget they've been given by government for something that is quite crucial and we are going to an election yeah. year next year. It shouldn't be the case if they really, really would like to implement this as soon as possible. So those are some of the, I think, contrast of what is happening. Well, yes, they accelerated the, um, it becoming a law, but then you're not really accelerating implementation of the same Right. Yeah. And that's always the case. I mean, you, you could have a law on anything and then implementing and and making sure that things are being enforced is, is a different question. Yeah. I mean, and, and just to add to that, too, I mean, the, the implementation process is, is very important and, and very much in the ethos of what the Open Internet for Democracy Leaders Program is, is really to equip those uh, emerging leaders to really continue on and identify what are some of the issues or challenges with a new policy or a law to strengthen it. Because oftentimes there are governments who write laws, who implement laws that are in isolation and siloed. So they it impacts the local business communities in, in different ways, and they're just not under uh, aware of uh, how they are impacted. Yeah. So, yes, I did also want to ask a question uh, really about um, Sheila and uh, about your Open Internet for a Democracy Leaders project. You were... Uh, Analyzing this uh, Kenya data protection law, could you please uh, just tell us what were some of the identification or challenges uh, with regard to it and how your project was able to raise awareness among the local business community of the importance of that bill? And maybe even uh, you had mentioned uh, in the past about the amendment process as well. And so maybe you you might want to add about that. So I think one of the challenges, um, as mentioned, is obviously the implementation. They've given a lot of, uh, I think, implementation course to the data commissioner on what the the punishment or uh, enforcement of, of this law should be and what punishment should look like. So she has to decide or her office has to decide what that looks like. That will potentially take a lot of time. Also, considering this is something new, if it was already within the law, then it would make a lot of sense. But now that she has to again draft something and then it has to go back to to be put in in, in a regulatory uh, framework within the the office, then it becomes um, a challenge. Secondly, I think compliance issue. The cost they were proposing for businesses to pay is quite high, especially for SMEs and startups. I do not believe most of them will be able to afford that. They also have a human resource factor where you must have a data protection officer in-house. So, I mean, that's also another cost for small businesses. And considering you know, the business environment right now with, with, um, with the pandemic and, and how it's affected a number of businesses, it's, it's a huge challenge. I think also understanding which tools they will require for collection, you know, recording, organizing and structuring or even analyzing or storage of data, that is also another cost. Uh, secondly, they've not really, uh, no, they've not particularly said whether you must have data centers here if you're an international organization. So what does that also mean for uh, companies that want to scale into the region or for companies that are in Kenya and are working across the, the globe? What does that mean for you know data as well for subjects who are outside Kenya and for companies outside Kenya, for data subjects who are already in the country? So that is not clear. So those, I think, are some of the few, I think, uh, either implementation challenges, but also amendments that should be considered. And, and this is something that we've already informed the, the Data Protection uh, Commissioner's Office uh, through the a number of forums they've been having. But we've also been having these discussions with, with startups and, and SMEs in, in the region, and that's where I come in. To, for them to be able to understand the importance of compliance to the importance of protecting their you know, data subjects and, in this case, who are their users and clients because some of them don't even, haven't put this in, 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 their, in their plans. They don't know in what, you know, for instance, for their websites, if they have to, to, to put new policies to ensure that the subjects understand that 
ownership of data is theirs and they can take that from the, the companies anytime and, and what processes they should follow. So we are still having those discussions. It's still quite early, but definitely awareness around security for individuals is, is something that I am really, really keen. We have another public event. We've been having a closed um, meetings with, uh, with SMEs and startups, but an awareness creation event that we will open up to the public for them to also you know contribute to this discussion we've been having the same on twitter spaces twitter is quite big in kenya but we we understand that this is you know uh locking out a number of people because quite a small percentage of people on twitter so we're opening it up so that people can see this on on youtube on, on facebook and participate i wish we could have physical meetings but unfortunately because of what is happening we cannot do that across the country but awareness creation is one of the things that my project is is has been focusing on and recommendation on 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 this current uh, data protection act especially for SMEs and and startups to be considered on especially uh, paying the the fee and what it means to comply while ensuring either you know they they have they can share data officer the, the, the data pro- protection officer or they can put other measures in house to ensure that they still protect the data of uh, data subjects Sheila let's talk about impact how do you measure impact so, say two years down the road three years down the road how do you know if you're making progress I think for me one is if we can ensure we change the you know the the, the inclusion of this uh, line on removing those books from buildings that I think will change a lot because that is one of our key cultural it's not even a culture to be honest it's just one of the bad behaviors I believe we have right. that really really need to change it's a, it's a bad habit is what it sounds like. <laughs> yes it's a bad habit we have if we could change that and that you know if, if it's within the law all buildings will be forced to do that. That is it. I think that would be the greatest impact for me because I feel from that point it might be difficult for people to to access you know very uh, uh, crucial information about people who I mean can easily take advantage of that data. Well, and, and that's, that includes banking information, tax information, about anything you can think of. Everything you can everything. find everything, everything because you're providing your national ID. Right. That's, yeah. So if if I have access to a national ID, I have access to all information about you. And unfortunately, for for Kenya, yeah. If you search for, for instance, if you know my ID number, you can get all information about me from government portal. Right. That's another loophole. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. And the ironic thing, it's a low tech solution to a high tech problem. It is. It is. Yeah. Which, yeah. Which, which is kind of ironic when you think about it. So. <laughs> Adam, let's look at lessons learned from this. You know, if, if I'm sure we have a lot of listeners out there who are thinking about these types of projects, and that's the reason they're listening to the podcast. Uh, what would you tell them based on what you've learned in Kenya and Adam and in you and other, some other countries, if they were going to start a project very similar to this, what, what were some of the things that you would tell them? Yeah, sure, Ken. I, I would say initially is to really take a step back. I mean, you have your own sphere, your own private sector, or you may be an entrepreneur of, of, of a business, but really taking a step back and look at who are the allies uh, in, in your local context and what are the issues and uh, uh, possibilities, opportunities to put forth a recommendation and to identify solutions to improve whatever issue is impacting you locally. I would, I would say that uh, really it's, we all have to do this together. And so it's really a multi-stakeholder sort of process uh, and a long uh, process at that. And so really maintaining that optimism and hope that that final impact will be uh, made. I, that is probably one of the, the top things I would I would share. But I'm definitely interested to hear more of what um, uh, Sheila's experience has been like as a leader. I, my experience has actually been really good. I think I have learned a lot, um, especially around internet freedom and, and principles of that uh, from this program. Also, I think interacting with other leaders who across the globe who are working on, on similar because I had a, a private sector background. Uh, while yes, I was I was keen on this, my focus was mostly on just data protection because I understood how that could affect business. 
And I think I've also seen um, the violation of that particular um, sensitive data. And so for me, it was just those two. But the exposure to other leaders who are working on, on different projects across the globe has been quite insightful. I think secondly, it just opens up a lot of opportunities for you to engage, learn, but also work on, on things that you believe locally could change, you know, especially internet freedom for uh, for your country. So I would tell people who are you know interested in that to definitely apply to this program. It's intense, but it's quite, quite useful. Yeah. We're getting close to the end of the podcast, and I told both of you that this would go by very quickly, and it did. But I want to find out, and I ask every single guest and co-host that, that come on the program, I want to find out if you're an optimist or pessimist. And if you're looking at your crystal ball and kind of project out five years from now, what do you see? And Sheila, I want to start with you. I am optimistic because Africa is a, a continent of young people. I think the, the population uh, median for the continent is like 16, 17 years. Uh, whether we like it or not, these kids will definitely use the internet. And so we must listen to them. And, and I, I've seen Gen Z do a lot of things in this continent that I think for our generation we are not able to, so that they give me a lot of hope. So I'm definitely optimistic. And Adam, last word with you. Yes, I would agree. I am also optimistic as well. I, you know, as painful as COVID, as the COVID nineteen pandemic has been uh, for many, uh, it has also been a wake up call um, on the importance of technology and the real world impact that it has on our everyday life. And through that, there's a greater attention to the need for that open internet, that uh, that open space for every individual to be able to interact politically, socially, and economically. And so I definitely am, am appreciative of that, of that uh, wake-up call and definitely uh, am, am looking forward to seeing how people use that opportunity. Well, Sheila, thanks so much for taking time out of your busy day. It's uh, late afternoon or actually early evening, isn't it, over in Kenya? What are you, I think you're about seven hours difference between Washington. It's actually almost 10 p.m. Yeah, it's getting late. Yeah, so I'm glad you stayed up for it. Our listeners certainly uh, do. And Adam, good seeing you and uh, finally meeting you, even though it's uh, virtual. But it was a lot of fun and uh, hope to have you back on again because I know this is an important topic and a lot, a lot of interest in it. So once again, thanks. And we'll see everybody next time. Take care. Democracy That Delivers has been brought to you by the Center for International Private Enterprise. For more information, please visit sipe.org.